Good evening. My name is Robert Capitalupo, and I am the president of the Yale chapter of the Federalist Society. Tonight, I have the distinct honor of sitting down with Professor Stephen Calabrese, one of the founding members of the Federalist Society as part of our 40 for 40 initiative celebrating 40 years of the Federalist Society. Professor Steve Calabrese is the Clayton J. and Henry R. Barber Professor of Law at Northwestern Pritzker School of Law. He's also a visiting professor at the Yale Law School, where I have had the honor to study with him. Professor Calabrese clerked for Ralph Winter, Robert Bork, and Justice Scalia. He also served as special assistant to Ed Meese in the Department of Justice. He's a graduate of Yale College, of Yale Law School, and is, of course, the chairman of the board of the Federalist Society. Professor Calabrese, thank you so much for being here with me tonight. Thank you very much, Robert. It's a great pleasure to be here with you and to celebrate the 40th anniversary of a wonderful, wonderful organization. And I'm so thrilled that we're able to do this. So 40 years ago, a band of ragtag law students set out to push back against the orthodoxy at our law schools. And you led that charge by planning the first conference of the Federalist Society in 1982. I think a great place to start would be to hear about what drove you to want to start a group like the Federalist Society? What was the climate on campus that really created this niche uh, for a group that cares about the free expression of ideas? Thank, uh, thank you, Robert, for that question. And uh, I think the answer goes back to um, election night 1980. And on election night, 1980, Professor Robert Bork, uh, who was uh, a friend of mine and one of whose sons I'd gone to college with, invited me and uh, two or three other conservative law students to watch the election returns of the Reagan Jimmy Carter election come in at his house. And we were thrilled to do that because we didn't want to watch the election returns in 1980 with a bunch of Yale law students, all of whom would be rooting for Jimmy Carter. Mm -hmm. So we went to Judge Bo to Professor Bork's house, as he, he was then called. And um, by 10, 10.30 at night, it was clear that President Ronald Reagan had won in a landslide over Jimmy Carter. Uh, President Reagan got 50% of the vote. Independent Republican candidate John Anderson got 10%. And the incumbent president, Jimmy Carter, got only 40%. So there was a Reagan landslide. And at 10.30, Judge Bork smiled happily. And he said to us, I'm going upstairs to go to bed. But if you want, guys want to stay up and watch the Senate returns, you're welcome to do that. So we stayed up to watch the Senate returns, and it got more and more exciting because there had been a Democratic majority in the Senate from 1954 until 1980. So it had been 26 years since there had been a Republican majority in the Senate. And it began to become clear watching the returns that the Republicans had a real chance at winning the Senate. And by four or five in the morning, sure enough, we had won 53 Senate seats or so. And when Judge Bork came down for breakfast, he found us still watching the election returns, celebrating the fact that we had won the Senate. And he was obviously very happy about that too. So I left his house and I went to my 8.45 a.m. torts class which was a class of about 85 people taught by Peter Schock, who is now a very sensible and reasonable person, but was probably a little more liberal when I had him as a torts professor. And Professor Schock turned our torts class into a group therapy session. 
And he asked, how could this something like this happen in our country? How could we go so wrong? And different people offered different theories and there was a lot of moping and crying about it. And finally, a professor Chuck asked, did anybody in this class actually vote for Ronald Reagan? And I and one other student out of 85 raised our hands. And at that point, I thought to myself, I want to have lunch with that other student. And I did have lunch with him and built friendships with other conservative students. And by the fall of 1981, uh, we began, we uh, really were ready to found the Yale Federalist Chapter. So the Yale Federalist Chapter is actually uh, six months older than the Federalist Society. It really began in the fall of 1981. Um, we needed, of course, informing the chapter to have a chapter faculty advisor. We asked Professor Ralph Winner if he would be our faculty advisor. He agreed, uh, although he said he was being nominated for a judgeship and he'd have to step down from that post once he was confirmed. Um, when we talked to Ralph about uh, forming a Federalist chapter, I remember vividly that the conversation began with Ralph saying to me, your Uncle Guido has ruined this law school. <laughs> and he then went on a tirade that lasted for 40 minutes, and then warmly said he would love to be our faculty advisor and he would love to have us uh, form a chapter. So we held our first event in January of 1982, and we brought in an assistant professor, Grover Joseph Reese, who later worked on judicial selection for Ed Meese to debate Burke Marshall, who had been Ted Kennedy's lawyer after Chappaquiddick on um, basically on originalism, although at the time we called it interpretivism. And um, unfortunately, our guy lost the debate. And Ralph Winter came up to me with a tear coming down of his cheeks and says, said, you're going to, you got to give up. There's no way you can save this place. It's hopeless. Uh, but we weren't ready to give up. So our next event was in March of 1982. We got Professor Richard Epstein, who was then 39 years old and at the University of Chicago, to come and give a talk. And Professor Epstein, I still can in, see him today, sitting in the faculty lounge giving his talk which was a talk about how Lochner against New York had been rightly decided. And there were about 10 Yale faculty members in the audience battering him with questions. Epstein carried the day. The event was a stunning success. And the Yale student chapter was pretty firmly established with a, you know, initial membership of maybe 10 or 20 students or so. But then there were a lot of people who came to our events who didn't want to be called members for various reasons, a phenomenon that I know continues down to the present day. We then decided, meanwhile, my friends from college, Lee Liverman Otis and David McIntosh, were starting a Federalist chapter at the University of Chicago Law School. And I'm not quite sure what the sequence of events was there, but they were far enough along so that in conversations, which I had with them nightly, uh, we decided that we really should have a national symposium. And I suggested a national symposium in April of 1982 on federalism, because all of us cared a lot about shrinking the power of the big national government. And they agreed. And we then, they then contacted their faculty advisor. Well, their faculty advisor was a guy named Professor Antonin Scalia. And Scalia said, this is a great idea. I actually know some conservatives at Harvard and Stanford and can put you in touch with them. And maybe all four chapters can co-sponsor that first symposium. And Professor Scalia also very helpfully called a foundation in New York and got us a $20,000 grant which is what we use to pay travel expenses and things like that for our speakers. So Professor Scalia was indispensable from the beginning. Um, 
The keynote speaker at the conference in April 1982, was, which was a, the first national Federalist Society event, which is why this is our 40th anniversary year. Um, the, the first conference began with a keynote speech by Judge Robert Bork, because everyone at the time assumed that Bork was about to be named to the Supreme Court. Uh, his name was listed prominently as the front runner in all the news articles that came. So it was really Bork with his fame who drew in the crowd. Bork had also been Solicitor General under Richard Nixon and for a time acting Attorney General. So he had a serious political experience in the Nixon administration as well as being a federal judge appointed by President Reagan. Um, the first conference was uh, held in room 120 at the law school. We filled the room. We had about 160 or 170 people come and we had to make plans as to where to put them and how, you know, how to deal with accommodations. And we didn't have very much money to, to work with. So the plan we came up with was we would find Yale students who would agree to let students from other schools sleep in sleeping bags on their dorm room floors. <laughs> and I was convinced that we had enough Yale students who were willing to let students from other schools sleep in sleeping bags on their dorm room floors so that we'd be fine. Gary Lawson, who is now a professor at Boston University, was in a complete state of panic about this and told me it was going to be a disaster. I said, don't worry, David McIntosh is an organizational genius and he's arriving tonight and he'll solve this problem. And the logistics all worked out great. And Yale you know, Law students wandered around in days because there were 170 conservatives from all over the country at Yale Law School and they had never seen a conservative <laughs> before. And so it was as if, it, it was as strange to them as if the, say is as if uh, the Mormon church, for example, had held a revival at Yale Law School attended by 170 people. I mean, they were completely baffled by it. But the conference was a rousing success. And after the conference, um, 16 students asked us how to form chapters at their own schools. Well, our first response was, we, didn't, we don't know. Our second response was, we'll write a guide on how to form a chapter at your school. So we wrote a guide on how to form a chapter and chapters formed at 16 schools. And uh, eventually there was a second annual symposium held at the University of Chicago because of Lee Otis's and David McIntosh's role in attending the first conference at Yale and in the founding. And uh, the, the second conference was a great success also. But uh, the, those are basically the sequence of events that, uh, that led to the holding of the first conference and the forming of the chapter. And, you know, I think that the irritation factor of Peter Schock asking me to raise my hand and being one of only two students in a room of 85 who voted for Reagan really made us want to have a group presence uh, that could be felt. And it was, uh, it was annoying and irritating to be treated as an isolated uh, uh, holder of a viewpoint. Um, Yale Law School is a very left-wing place. It was very left-wing when I was a student here. Still uh, is. At Yale Law School. And um, I would say that um, Yale, the relationship between the Federal Society and Yale Law School is like the relationship between a grain of sand and an oyster. And what happens is if you have an oyster and it gets a grain of sand in it, it starts secreting things around the grain of sand until it constructs a pearl. And that protects the oyster from the irritation of the grain of sand. Well, I think the Federal Society was a grain of sand in the oyster of the Yale Law School. And we irritated the Yale Law School and they grew a large pearl and that pearl was the Federal Society. 
So I would say we are born from the opposition of the Yale Law School community and very much in response to it, but we also, from the beginning, we're committed to debate and discussion, and we invited people of different points of view and didn't simply try to lecture people on what we thought. But that would be my account of the, the founding of both the Yale chapter and the holding of the first conference. So what was the state of conservative legal thought at the time of the group's founding? I guess 10 years prior or so, we, we had Robert Bork's famous article, Neutral Principles. We uh, are just coming off of the Burger Court. There seems to be some sort of need at that time uh, to restrain justices from just ruling based on caprice. But in your view, were we in the early days of originalism? Was it the Federalist Society that made it so originalism was possible? Or would you say that because there was already a conversation going on about this interpretivist methodology that it made the founding of the chapter more viable? Well, um... The, the state of conservative legal thought in 1982 was embryonic. It wasn't as developed as it is by, by any means as developed as it is today. Um, the first real major article is the one you mentioned by Judge Bork, Neutral Principles and Some First Amendment Problems. And the thing that is the most important thing that Bork argues for, the, for in that article is that constitutional law has to not only lay down a neutral rule that it will apply equally across cases, but that rule has to be derived in a neutral way that is divorced from a person's politics. And so Bork in that article basically was challenging legal realism. And re legal realism is a movement that began at Yale Law School in the 1920s and reached a fever peak, peak pitch during the 1930s to, to the 1950s. And the legal realists essentially believed that judging is inherently political and that judges should simply decide cases according to their political viewpoint and that law was meaningless and insignificant. And Bork in the neutral principle article said, no, that's not good enough. Uh, that's contrary to the rule of law and not of men. We need to have the principles that we apply need to be neutrally derived. Following Bork, Raoul Berger published a book about the original intentions of the framers of the 14th Amendment. And that put original intentions in play as uh, one way of neutrally deriving principles. Uh, the sort of centrist scholar, John Hart Ely, published a book called Democracy and Distrust, A Theory of Judicial Review in 1980, which I actually read in August of 1980, right before I started law school. And Ely said that constitutional law was divided in a fight between interpretivists who wanted to interpret the constitution and non-interpretivists who wanted to derive principles from some source outside the constitution. And he then went on to say that this was a, a hopeless debate, that both sides were wrong and he proposed his own theory, which is subject to much criticism that wouldn't be relevant here. But I think Healy did us a favor by describing what Bork had said and what Raoul Berger had said as interpretivism, because it meant not only a focus on the intentions of the framers, but also interpreting the documents that they wrote. Um, when originalism um, was made famous by Attorney General Ed Meese, in July of 1985, he was invited uh, his first time as attorney general, he was invited to speak to the American Bar Association. And he used his speech to denounce the Supreme, the Burger Court's jurisprudence, uh, 
he criticized every major case decided in that term. And he explained how if you looked at the original intentions of the framers, those cases all should have come out differently. Well, this provoked quite a reaction coming from an attorney general of the United States criticizing the Supreme Court at an ABA annual meeting. And justices William Brennan and John Paul Stevens both gave speeches criticizing Mies and criticizing what was then called interpretivism. Uh, Mies then responded with a speech that was very carefully prepared, which he delivered at a Federalist Society event in Washington, D.C., which caused the Federalist Society's name to appear on the front page of the New York Times for the first time ever, and under the headline, Attorney General Responds to Supreme Court Justices. And then the Federalist Society published a book called The Great Debate, which included Mises' two speeches, the Brennan and, and Stevens speeches, and then a speech by Judge Robert Bork, continuing to argue for original intent. The, the full development of originalism happened in June of 1986, when then Judge Antonin Scalia, three days before he was nominated to the Supreme Court, gave a speech at the Justice Department and said, it's not the original intentions of the framers that we should care about. It's the original public meaning of the text of the Constitution or of the text of the Constitution's amendments. And we should focus on the words they used and the public meaning of those words, not on, on intentions. And Scalia had a lot of very good arguments for this. He had been arguing in statutory cases for textualism over legislative history. He basically said large groups of people don't have a common intent. There's no way to measure it. There's no way for the public to know what their intent is and write in letters complaining about what they're doing. So law has to be about texts either statutory text or the constitutional text. So I would say that originalism as we know it today had three authors. Bork who contributed the idea that law had to be something other than your politics. It had to be external to your politics. Um, Mies who really emphasized uh, the importance of the original history and the original intentions of the framers and who publicized the idea in a way that had never been publicized before. And then Scalia, who came up with the idea of original public meaning textualism. Now, Mies, as attorney general, first got Scalia nominated to the Supreme Court and then got Bork nominated to the Supreme Court. So he gave them a national stage to talk about originalism. And they use that national stage to talk about originalism. Judge Bork, unfortunately, was not confirmed to the Supreme Court by a Democratic Senate, but his hearings went on for three weeks and Americans heard an awful lot about originalism during those three weeks. Um, so I would, I would say that you're right, in 1982 at the founding, thinking about originalism was still embryonic, but there were some critical ideas out, out there in the air. So we move from in 1982, a period where someone even promulgating the idea of originalism gets laughed out of the classroom to 40 years later, of course, the famous saying by Justice Kagan, we are all originalists now. And I think that the Federalist Society, of course, had no small part in making that the case. So on the institutional side, not only did you found the Federalist Society at Yale, but then move on to creating the Federalist Society as a national organization to not only reach out to law students, uh, but also to lawyers and practitioners and academics across the country. What was that transition like to go from working in government 
to actually um, trying to advocate for the principles that the Federalist Society stands for on the other side. Well, of course, one wonders, you know, what gave birth to the lawyers division of the Federal Society? And I think the answer to that, which is at the heart of your question, is that those of us who started the Federal Society at law school graduated, uh, thankfully, and uh, became lawyers ourselves. We, uh, you know, in my case, I clerked for Judge Winter and Judge Bork. Uh, in Lee Leverman Otis's case, she clerked for Judge Scalia on the DC Circuit. Uh, David McIntosh went into practice for a while, but ultimately, at Judge Bork's recommendation, Ed Meese hired me to be his special assistant on constitutional law issues and put me in charge of interviewing judicial candidates including for the DC circuit and other circuit courts uh, around the country. Um, but once there were a group of us lawyers working in the Justice Department in Washington and on other parts of the Reagan administration, we wanted to have a lawyer's chapter in Washington, DC. So we started holding meetings at a Chinese restaurant of all things. And uh, uh, they, I would say there were probably 60 people or so who would come to those lunch meetings, 60 to 80 people. And we invited in some great speakers. Attorney General Meese spoke, uh, um, Judge Bork spoke, Judge Scalia spoke. Uh, we had a number of very dis distinguished people and it became known as a real hotspot for gatherings of conservatives in Washington. The Solicitor General at the time was Charles Freed, who is a liberal Republican from Massachusetts and who was never on board with originalism. But he decided that our lunches were getting so much attention that he needed to attend one. So he arrived at one of our lunches at the Chinese restaurant and he happened to bump into an assistant Solicitor General named Sam Alito who was the most junior person in his office. And Charles Freed said, as only Charles Freed could do, Sam, this is so awkward. This is so strange. Why, why this is like finding, meeting a friend in a bordello. <laughs> <laughs> that gives you an example of what we were up against. Um, once the Washington DC chapter became a huge success, we started a chapter in New York City and in Chicago and in other cities. And of course, today we have chapters in every major city in the country. And uh, after the, I think the Washington DC chapter started holding events in about uh, 1985 when I started working for Ed Meese and finished my clerkship with Judge Borg. By 1986 or 87, there were enough lawyers chapters so that we had our first lawyers convention. And I still remember introducing the keynote speaker to our first lawyers convention, who was none other than Vice President George Herbert Walker Bush, which shows you the level of support we were getting from the Reagan administration. And of course, ultimately President Reagan himself spoke to uh, the, the lawyers convention uh, in 1988. But, Essentially what, what Reagan and Meese did is they took the charisma and political popularity of the Reagan administration and they funneled it into shining a spotlight on the Federalist Society and they institutionalized their charisma. They institutionalized their, their message and what they cared about. And so that's why the Federalist Society 40 years, 35 years after Ed Meese finished being attorney general is still working to accomplish the very things that he was talking about when he was attorney general. And I should add for our audience that attorney general Meese is a member of the Federal Society Board of Directors and he will turn 91 on December 2nd. And he uh, has been a stout supporter of the Federalist Society from the first days 
he was attorney general up until uh, our last board meeting. So I have but one question left, uh, but before I ask that, uh, I would like to remind the viewing audience that in a second, we will turn to the question and answer portion. So if you would like to ask a question to Professor Calabrese in these remaining 10 minutes or so, feel free to either use the Q&A function that you uh, see at the bottom of your screen or raise your virtual hand and I will call on you uh, in due time. So please, let's uh, get those questions coming. Uh, I'm sure uh, Professor Calabrese is excited to answer. So Happy my final day. question draws back to something that I think you and I both hold extremely dear, that being the Yale chapter of the Federalist Society. First, a chapter and certainly the finest chapter. Now, in these last few years and also last few weeks, we've seen a lot of strife being poised at the Yale chapter. We have, we have seen, um, we've seen a lot of a controversy brewing out of or around the Yale chapter. Uh, and it seems like some folks might be willing to give up on the Yale chapter. Uh, so I would like to ask you as the current president for a bit of advice to our founder. Uh, why is the Yale Law School chapter of the Federalist Society worth fighting for? Because it's the Yale Law School chapter that was the most irritated by leftists and which formed first. And we've, you know, we've always had a, a huge chapter and a successful chapter at Yale, in part because their people were mad at. And in contrast, it's very hard to get a chapter, big chapter going at Brigham Young University because the faculty there is pretty reasonable. And so students don't feel the same need to organize. Uh, but conservative and libertarian students at Yale or anyone who's right of center even moderate liberals who believe in freedom of speech are drawn to the Federalist Society because of the attacks on freedom of speech that occur at Yale. And uh, one example of those attacks is that last year there was a debate held uh, which uh, included uh, a participant from the Alliance Defense Fund, uh, which has on occasion uh, litigated against LGBTQ call, uh, positions on various issues. And Yale students were so riled up that there was a huge loud demonstration outside in the hallway. And then of all things, the Dean of Students, Ellen Cosgrove, opened the door to the room where our meeting was and encouraged the hecklers to come in the room and heckle the meeting and try to prevent the meeting and the debate from going on. Well, this is an action by a, a law school official, Ellen Cosgrove, the Dean of Students, and it was quite outrageous. Uh, there were other things that happened last year that were outrageous too, but I, I think Dean Cosgrove's behavior uh, is, is, was in, is central to those as well. Well, I, I met with Dean Heather Gherkin uh, about 10 days ago to discuss the situation of Yale's relationship to the Yale Federalist chapter. And what she told me is that Dean Cosgrove resigned over the summer or left office. Uh, I don't know whether it was a forced resignation or not, but in any event, she's not there. Uh, another person in the Dean of Students office who had been assisting her in harassing conservative students was assigned to other duties that don't involve interaction with law students. And Dean Gherkin assured me that she's hired a new Dean of Students who is, re respects freedom of speech and freedom of debate. I must say Dean Gherkin has herself always been very supportive of the Federalist Society uh, and of uh, um, 
ideological diversity at the law school. And uh, so in any event, Dean Cosgrove is gone and the other offending member of the Dean of Students office is gone. Um, Dean Gherkin knows that one of the, the central concerns that Federal Society members have is that they'd like to have some originalist or conservative faculty. Uh, well, uh, when my name was put up, I got a majority vote, but not a two thirds majority vote. And I think being a co-founder of the Federal Society will forever be a fatal sin in the eyes of the Yale faculty. But I'm happy to say that a very, very good friend of mine, and a, I think the best young originalist scholar of his generation, Sai Krishna Prakash, is visiting at Yale Law School this fall. He's teaching a class on presidential power. I express support to Dean Gherkin for tenuring him, and she told me she strongly supported tenuring him. So we'll see whether two thirds of the faculty are willing to hire uh, Sai Krishna Prakash, who is a committed originalist and who I should add is a former clerk to Justice Clarence Thomas, who's never been accused of being squishy on much of anything. So, and I would say that all of us are very grateful to be uh, taking Professor Prakash's class this fall. So I think we'll have time for one audience question. Um, and I think that I would be doing the Yale chapter a disservice if I did not give this a question. Uh, uh, Robert, let Professor? me just say one, I want to say sure. one more thing. Sure. Um, in, in Dean Gherkin's defense, all of you should know that Dean Gherkin uh, has supported me as a visiting professor at Yale in the fall for the full five years of her deanship. And she's paid half my annual salary with Northwestern paying the other half. So although I'm not a tenured Yale faculty member, I am on campus. I have dinners with all of 1L student members of the Federalist chapter. I usually do an event with the Federalist chapter when I'm on campus. And when it's possible to, I've attended Federalist chapter working groups. So I wouldn't be here if it weren't for Dean Gherkin. So uh, what I would say to, for example, Judge Ho, who called for a boycott on giving clerkships to Yale students is that, uh, hey, hey, you're shooting conservative conservatives in the head by doing that. There are real conservatives at Yale and they're more ardently conservative because they have to deal with, with such leftist critics. And so, yes, there's hostility at Yale. There's always been hostility at Yale. And that's why the Federal Society was born at Yale. So Robert, back to you. Thank you. Uh, we'll uh, turn it over now uh, to last year's president of the Yale Federalist Society, Zach Austin, for his question. Zach. Zach, I think you're muted. You need to unmute. All right, that was uh, that was Robert. He didn't have a Zoom presidency to deal with. Can you hear me? Uh, <laughs> okay. It's good to hear from you. Uh, my question is about a different, um, I guess you could say, divide that's emerged in the last couple of years with the rise of common good constitutionalism. Um, I ask, do you think FedSoc has seen a similar sort of internal split among members who might otherwise have been inclined to agree before? Or is this something new in the history of the organization? Well, I'd say the Federal Society has always been a collection of people who are right of center who disagreed about things. And from the founding of the society, we had debates between libertarian conservatives like Richard Epstein and Bernie Segan on the one hand, and Richard Posner and social conservatives like Judge Bork and Justice Scalia and Lino Gralia of Texas uh, on the other hand. So there was always a libertarian uh, social conservative divide. Uh, there's also 
always there 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 have been uh people who are fairly centrist or moderately liberal who joined who joined the chapter simply because we were in favor of free speech and because we organized debates and it's so much more fun to listen to a debate than it is to be lectured at so you know i welcome the challenge of the common good constitutionalists and of adrian vermule and I will say right here now, Adrian Vermeule, I will debate you on common good constitutionalism anywhere in the country that you are willing to debate. And I say that because Adrian Vermeule has turned down every offer that we have made to have a debate with him about originalism versus common law constitutionalism. So I'm, I must say, I can't have much regard for a movement whose founder and author is unwilling to debate to just to debate in public with other origin with originalists in contrast i think originalism is the right answer uh i think last year's supreme court term proves originalism is the right answer uh in the dobbs case uh justice alito wrote an originalist opinion overturning Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood of Pennsylvania against Casey. Justice Thomas wrote an originalist concurrence calling for getting rid of all the right to privacy cases under the due process clause and considering whether they, they could instead fit under the privileges or immunities clause. Uh, and uh, uh, in any event, uh, even Ju Chief Justice Roberts, who said that he would have gotten rid of Roe in three or four cases, concurred in the judgment, meaning he agreed with the overruling of Roe and of Casey. So that's six to three on overruling Roe and Casey. That's a huge development. I mean, this is the fight over abortion has gone on for 49 years since Roe was developed, and it was overturned, and it was overturned by originalists. There were other originalist opinions last term. Um, I think another very important opinion was the, uh, the uh, New York Rifle and Pistol Association against Bruin opinion dealing with the right to carry a gun uh, and to be licensed to carry a gun. And the Supreme Court in that case also found that there was a right to carry a gun and they found that New York's standardless uh, licensing process, which was followed by only six states and rejected by 43 states, was a violation of the Second Amendment. So there's now a case, um, both the Supreme Court has now both held you have a right to possess a gun in your home and you have a right to carry a gun in public under some circumstances. And it's done that on squarely originalist grounds by looking at what the Second Amendment originally meant and also at what it meant in 1868 when the 14th Amendment was adopted, which incorporated it. Another big originalist victory last term in the Supreme Court was in West Virginia against EPA, where the court held uh, that there is a major questions doctrine such that when an agency uses its delegated powers to address a major question like global warming, uh, it has to get permission from Congress before it can regulate. Well, that's basically a, a revival of the non-delegation doctrine, just giving the non-delegation doctrine a different name, the major questions doctrine. And that opinion was handed down uh, 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 six to three, and clearly was an originalist victory. There were also important originalist victories in cases involving religious liberty, both in terms of uh, uh, government funds going to religious schools in Maine, and in terms of a football coach being allowed to pray during halftime on field. Um, so I, I think originalism, I think of the, of the six current Supreme Court justices, I think all of them are originalists to some degree or another. I would say that two of them are half originalist and half something else. Chief Justice Roberts is half an originalist 
and half a believer in Thayerian judicial restraint. And so he always wants to move slowly and incrementally, which is not necessarily always the wisest way to proceed. Uh, but he is also an originalist and he concurred in the judgment in Dobbs. He didn't, uh, uh, he didn't dissent from it. Um, and then uh, Justice Alito uh, sometimes is a conservative legal realist and sometimes writes originalist opinions. So he's sort of half originalist and half conservative legal realist. One can hardly fault him for being a legal realist because when he attended Yale Law School in the 1970s, legal realism was the only thing that was being taught. Um, so if you, if you count them as half, that means that of the six Republican appointed justices, five of them are originalist and half of two others are something else. But I think last term was a great victory for originalism. And I think it should put an end to the speculation about common good constitutionalism. I think it, it would be terrible to go back to judges uh, deciding things based on their own view of what is good, what, what the common good is. I think that was the whole thing that Judge Bork was striking against in his First Amendment, in his Neutral Principles article. So, um, Thank you for the question, and I appreciate the question. I think there are common good constitutionalists in the Federalist chapter, and we're happy to have them in the chapter, and we're happy to have debates on originalism versus common good constitutionalism. But I think that last term, the Supreme Court really proved itself that originalism will carry the day on a wide range of issues from abortion rights, to the Second Amendment, to the non-delegation doctrine, to religious freedom. And we at the Yale chapter would love to host that a debate between you and Professor Bermule if he is willing. It's an open invitation. Well, I think that is about all the time that we have this evening. But before we go, I just want to say Professor Akawabrizi, that all of us at the Yale a chapter, myself included, are extremely grateful for your service to Yale Law School, to the Federalist Society, and to the conservative legal movement. I owe so much to the Yale FedSoc. I really do not think that I would have enjoyed my time at Yale Law School if it were not for Yale FedSoc. So I do really thank you for uh, putting in that work 40 uh, years I ago really to I make it really, bearable for us. Th thank you, Robert. I really want to thank you and Zach and others who served as chapter presidents over the last 40 years. Obviously, there have been 40 chapter presidents, one each year. So a lot of people have contributed to this enterprise. And you and Zach both have done a tremendous job during your tenures in keeping the whole thing going. And, you know, it's uh, law school generational cycles are very fluid. Your students are only in law school for three years, so it's very easy for a chapter to go extinct. But uh, Yale Law School has proven that it can ser serve up enough irritation to keep the Federal Society alive and well for 40 years now, and I see no signs that that's going to diminish in the future. Well, thank you so much for being here with us. And thank you so much to our audience for tuning in. This is the first event uh, in our 4440 series coming down the pike. We will have interviews with the founders of Stanford, Chicago, and Harvard chapters. But for now, that will be all this evening. For the Federalist Society, my name is Robert Capitolupo. Thank you for watching this evening.